we're coming to you uh, live from uh, Park Slope, Brooklyn and Shoreditch, London, where Stefan is. And, um, and we're, we're um, having this talk uh, on the occasion of a, sh uh, a show of new works by Stefan Brueggemann in uh, San Moritz um, that, uh, that he's made uh, very recently during uh, this uh, you know, lockdown and these really unprecedented times that we're going through. And, and there's, a, there's a film that's on the Hauser & Work website where he talked about making these these pieces with a sense of quote fear and speed that that th these do kind of come from a sense of of physical crisis and existential crisis and um, and and they're they're touching on kind of what we're all going through right now. Um, so maybe we we can start going through images and talking about St Stefan's work uh, from the beginning has been really preoccupied with language. Um, and he comes from a lineage of, uh, of artists going back to uh, the early 60s who, um, you know, really began to bring language <clears throat> into visual art, uh, even before conceptualism, but certainly in, you know, um, the high conceptualist era. Um, so I thought maybe what, what we could do, we, we could start with an image that I, I'm, I, I just, I threw in here. I, I, I'm a fan of Helen Levitt, the photographer Helen Levitt, and she um, was really preoccupied with taking pictures of children playing on the streets of New York, and there's some of her best images. And among, a, a lot of those images have to do with children writing on the streets. And sometimes they're writing things that you can, you can read and parse. Um, uh, and, and sometimes they're making images that you can you can understand, but often it feels very hieroglyphic, and it feels like a, an impulse that is deeply human that goes back to the caves of of making marks of, on the street, uh, expressing yourself physically with language. And um, you know, it seems to me that uh, both in the way that we consume language online and in the way that we consume language in urban spaces your your work has dealt with that and and i guess maybe the first question would be to what degree did mexico city and and that urban environment and muralism for example which we've talked about before and language on the streets how much did that affect your the shaping you as an artist well uh, i i remember that uh, when I was a kid, obviously, uh, I was drawing, painting a lot at the time. No? And, but I have a very vivid memory in, in the drawings that I was doing when I started writing the word no, and no. So it was like, like a, a real revelation in terms of the, the in-betweenness of writing and drawing. No, those those limits that I can see uh, also connected to the image that you just uh, posted. No, this idea of where is the limit of writing and where is the limit of drawing, and and how those two things sometimes, uh, in some cases, are the two things at the same time. No, mm -hmm. and then also this idea of of uh, Growing up in, in Mexico, I, I had two parents uh, that uh, are archaeologists. So, lots of my childhood, I was uh, either in Baroque churches or in uh, pre Hispanic uh, sites. You know? So, it was a very uh, intense uh, this uh, activity of uh, reading at Art, reading architecture, reading iconography, reading uh, some type of language that uh, you're not used to. So I have a very, yeah, that was my surroundings when I was a kid. You know, that's where I used to go for vacation. You know? Right. It was more, more that kind of uh, scenario. So yes, I feel very connected to 
space, writing, and painting. No, that three, those three elements for me are very uh, present in, 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 in my childhood. Right. We, we had talked before about, um, uh, you know, in, on the streets in physical space and urban spaces, these uh, marks that almost feel incidental. I mean, they're, they're not graffiti and they're actually, I think they're, they're put on the sidewalk by, uh, you know, municipal workers to talk about where they need to do work, but they end up being these, you know, especially because they're done in that screaming orange, um, they, they end up, you know, looking almost like art. Um, so, so I grabbed a couple of these from, you know, they're, they're ubiquitous. I'm not so sure about London, but they're ubiquitous on the streets. Yeah. Here, well, here I, I actually, when I was doing my first show at Castle and Reef in 2016, that I presented, one of the pieces I exhibited was uh, headlines and last lines in the movies where right. I uh, write headlines of newspapers and last lines in the movies with a spray can and you know, writing. Right. I, was, I, I select colors depending on the place. And in that specific installation, I was fascinated by this fluorescent orange that you find all these markings in, in, in New York. And also how it relates of how the, the world is being shaped you know, through media and cinema. And also, how the cities reshape all the time in New York, you know, like they're digging, putting more pipes, you know, all the time right. you're right. constructing the city. It's like also happens here in, in, in London, no, it's, it never ends, no, it's like you never finish uh, the urban landscape of the city, you know, constantly is being reshaped. And right. so I thought that that was a good uh, analogy with a specific installation of headlines and last lines in the movie, where my idea is to comment on how we shaped our present future, you know? how unconsciously we're, we're being shaping the, the, the future. Right. We, um, uh, you know, we're uh, living in this time right now, certainly in New York and a lot of other American cities, but I think probably some of this is happening in, in um, Europe also, and, and maybe in Asia, with the, the, um, the murder of George Floyd and the police, the anti-police protests and the social justice protests where um, language, you know, not, not image graffiti, but language protest painting has really shown back up on the streets um and uh you know there's a there's a sort of a uh a, a, a base for it now which is um uh, plywood that's been put up to protect windows um there's still a lot of that on the streets in new york uh and you, you, we had looked at a couple of these images before and you you actually did talk about seeing them um in a language sense almost as a new form of muralism yeah well, I mean, when I was uh, doing this this specific work in New York in, in the gallery, I think that what is very interesting of, of this type of writing is that I think it's, it's, it's the, the, the one type of writing that it really resonates like the noise of the screen of, 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 of society. You know? It really, uh, you know, it really creates a, this layer of voices and noise and connecting it to this way of new muralism that I, I sometimes like to, to talk about, but in, uh, the muralists in Mexico were illustrating ideology. You know? They were illustrating certain ideas, political ideas, mm -hmm. but in a very figurative way, you know, like a, a figurative narration. And in this case, I think the, the, the way of using this type of writing on the walls uh, reflects on the same idea, but in a more contemporary way. You know? And also, I, I remember 
once having a conversation with uh, Glenn O'Brien, and we were talking about this concept of being street pro, you know, like you being, being, again, being street, street pro, like a street professional, you know, like, right? Like you grab this kind of iconography of of the street of the of, of, of society, but you make it in a way that it's uh, no, not professional, but you 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 incorporate it into a professional vocabulary. Right, right. This now, this this um, image that we're looking at now, this was Vancouver, correct? Is this uh, yeah. and yeah, and that actually, was a few years ago. Yeah, actually, I think this was one of my most successful interventions of this series of the headlines and last lines in the movies, mm -hmm. because in in Vancouver there's no graffiti, so it really stands out more than if it was done in. New York or Mexico or London, where you see that there's some interventions on the walls. Vancouver, or at least in that specific area where, where the museum is, it's very clean. So people were very shocked. Like mm -hmm. the neighbors were coming out and like they really thought like a revolution happened or a strike or a, because they were like, they couldn't believe that somebody took the courage to go and say something on on the wall. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 it was very interesting to do that. And also the idea of having the plywood cover the whole the facade of the museum. Right. Like the people around there they really thought something really bad was happening. Right. Well, it, it, it's interesting how pl plywood in an urban sense, plywood is a language. It's it says a, either you're constructing something or you're tearing something down or there's been a problem and something is closed. Yeah, I see. I see. When I use the plywood, I see it more as a concept of resistance. It's about resisting, you know, like you cover it, not to show what it's inside or not to let people get in. Block right. it, you know. So I think it has like a lot of connotations of resisting. Yeah? Right. It's probably it's not the way, not the way Donald Judd would have used it, but it's um exactly. <laughs> it's it's got its own resonance here. Um, I uh, so this this is a more this is inside. This is at the Pompidou uh, with last year, I believe. Yeah, uh, 2019. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and this is also, uh, last lines, correct? Yeah. In this Head, headlines and last lines. Yeah. In this case, it's called headlines and last lines in the movies, brackets Guernica. So what I did there is that I, uh, copied the scale of the Guernica of Picasso, that it's seven meters, almost eight meters by three meters. So I replicated the same size and I used a, a, a material that it was reflective, almost like stainless steel polish. And also there, I was connecting this concept of the Guernica that it was really making a, a reflection on how dehumanized society was in the Second World War when they attacked the the town of Guernica, where there were no men, there were only women and children. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was like how it was not like a, it was very brutal the attack. You know? and, mm -hmm. and Picasso got inspired by that. And in, in the same way, I think that this series talks about the same thing. You know? Like when you hear all the news, all, 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 all the films, all, all the language we're using and how fiction and reality mixes, like how fake news becomes part of this world and, and how brutal is the way the media has the power to send messages. Mm -hmm. It's like sending bombs to a, to a town of Guernica. No, it's right. almost the same thing. No? So I was reflecting on that. 
it, it strikes me uh, looking at some of these where you're borrowing uh, the language, the, the, the visual language of the streets and the way language manifests itself on the streets that there is over the last, you know, the last 20 years as language has become uh, the, the, the way we consume um, and share language online and through social media, where it becomes very fragmented uh, and very disjointed and where it feels like it's seen uh, at high speed uh, in passing. And it's often, um, you know, whether it's graffiti or corporate language or advertising language, uh, it, that it's, it's, it's kind of a screaming volume, uh, which often is the way it feels like when we consume language, um, not on the printed page, but on a screen. And that your work has been in that space for a while of that, that uh, the, the, the way in the 21st century language is, um, you know, has been really, really ripped apart and, and, and also weaponized as, as you're talking about. Um, and, and social media allows for, to, to me anyway, allows for the weaponization of language in a way that print media ne never could. It, we just didn't operate at, at that speed or it, it could be weaponized in print, but not the way it can be with um you know with twitter for example um yeah. and so, so some of this work r reminds makes me think of that that you're operating in that space thinking about those things yeah totally and and and, and how immediate and, and powerful you can be and also how uh, you can be also how the situation can be so irresponsible also, you know, like you're allowed to say anything and transmit it to everybody. You know? So there's so, there's this question of freedom also that I am I'm very curious about. You know? Like we are all free to say whatever we want, you no, know? and, and, and nobody edits it anything. You know? So and that really I think we have never been in a stage in civilization where that has happened. You know? that mm. Everybody believes in what they their own truth you know? and then i come back to a, a, a very interesting uh, essay from a philosopher from princeton university harry frankfurt he has a, a great essay that's just called bullshit so oh, right. Right. so so he explains that i mean we're, we're full of bullshit in, in our language you no know? because nobody's telling a lie or a truth is just bullshit. It's just something that it's there to to be predominant in, in some agenda, but they're not related to anything. It's just filling up the space. Right, right. Now th this is um, this is in New York, right? This is at 69th Street. Yeah, House. exactly. Um, and I think also when when I when I bring this into the gallery, when you come out to, to the gallery, you, you you may perceive the street in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, like obviously, in, in when you make a, a high contrast of, of of something, when you come back to it, now you see it differently. No, now, now I, I think like the images. When I see those marks on the street in New York, I see them also like kind of public art, no? like right. free public well, art. Art is public art is free, but it's like at the end they 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 they, they gain a, an aesthetical value that maybe you were not perceiving it before. Right, and it, it's interesting to me, you know, when you see this work on on plywood out outdoors, or you see it on a on a, what's essentially a canvas in a museum, but then when you see it on the walls in a in a fairly pristine, uh, you know, white cube townhouse art space, it has a it has a different effect. It all you know it really does feel a little bit more violent, violating, um, you know, like something's been uh, taken over. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. What, what I think always uh, you have to confront the viewer and, and, and always my work tries to be very confrontational. You know? So obviously 
the work is pointing at you immediately. No, it's, it's, it's not uh, welcoming you or just giving you some type of pleasure. It's, it's really confrontational and, right. and activates you to, to, to doubt about the work and how can I handle this situation? No? Like maybe some right. people who enter this, or when I was doing it, People were watching from the street thinking that maybe I was just somebody that randomly came into the building and I was doing something that I was not being, uh, didn't have any permission or somebody right. kind of saw this as, as something very exciting, you know, like it stimulates you in a different way. Right, right. Um, I, I uh, wanted to talk about the ways in which you feel like you've inherited um, uh, the influence of some of your forebears who who worked primarily with language, and I, I know that you you did a uh, you, that you spent time and you did a collaborative work with um, with Robert Barry, um, and so I, I thought you know one thing maybe we could we we'll come back to this this uh, work of yours in Fieldston, um, uh, but I, I wanted to you know just maybe quickly. Um, Sort of scroll through some, you know, the, the way that that uh, language began to come in to art. I mean, this is obviously Cy Twombly, who was who was taking aesthetic effect from from ancient graffiti. Yeah. Um, um, and then we, we come up to somebody who uh, who I know is a big influence for you, uh, William Burroughs, um, and you know who was. Uh, who, who, along with Brian Geisen, pioneered the cut-up method, which is really sort of taking language and tearing it up to try to um, to try to fight against its its power structures um, to a degree. Um, and and this is a uh, this is actually one of Burroughs's uh, paintings where he paintings and quotes, you know, where he he shot uh, a. Um, uh, a fingerprint register, I guess, from an arrest, probably of his. Um, this is this is Brian Geisen, um, who you know Geisen, who was bringing in intelligible language um, and also bringing in things that felt very kind of kabbalistic or hieroglyphic. Um, this is Jesse Howard, who's an outsider, uh, outsider American artist who didn't see himself as an artist, but who just made these, these sort of, um, uh, th these signs where language just like pushed and exploded from the sides of all these signs. Um, this is Ray Johnson, who, who I, we don't think of so much as a, as a language artist, but because he operated through the mail, you know, a good half of his, of what he was doing was, was words. Um, this is Joseph Boyce, obviously, uh, and, and I know you, you've talked before about the importance of these, um, these blackboards to you, um, you know, which were, which are used in lectures, um, and, and were functional, but then, you know, b become these kind of almost Dada painting works. Um, this is Adrian Piper. Um, which, you know, and you look at Adrian, this, this work by Adrian Piper now, and it's, it, it feels, I guess it's always prescient, but it, but it certainly feels like a work for the moment right now. Yeah, completely. Um, this is Mira Schindel. Um, you know, and her work toggled between this what what you were talking about earlier, you know, as influence of your of your youth, toggled between out the alphabet language and and mark just mark making that approximated the alphabet and that that space between the two, of of what's intelligible language and then what's just mark making. What who who, who do you feel like were some of the artists who worked with language that that um, uh, moved you in that direction? Well, I, 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 I mean, 
all of what we have seen is, is obviously of my knowledge. And uh, one, right. one, one that, I, that, I, that I really opened up my mind was on Kawara. Mm. I remember as a teenager, I was already like uh, starting collecting all my, my paintings and I was very active already at that early uh, age. I did my first uh, watercolor that I signed at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. okay. so I have the same signature that I have now, but when I was 14, but it was when I decided to, to become an artist, no matter what, you know? like it was like signing a pact with the devil. And so I, I started from, from that mm -hmm. age on. And, and I remember looking at one issue of Art Forum and discovering on Kawara on an advertisement of the show, of, I don't know which gallery it was, but, but it had that the, the date painting, you know, that he just painted the date where he painted that painting. You know? So it was, I don't know, November, whatever. So that really made me think that you could use information, language, and narrative in a different way that I, I was not, it was not still in my understanding. So mm -hmm. I think Onkawara really it was somebody that uh, made a, a very uh, strong impact in my way of transforming my paintings and starting to include words in my paintings and understanding that there was another, another way of, of, of doing uh, art. So he was, yeah, a, a very strong influence on me. And then after a long time, I discovered that he went to study to Mexico. Mm, so I know that. before, yeah, it's, it's, it's the most weird story. He was a, a, a painter, a figurative painter, and he went to the academy in Mexico. And that, and there is when he started doing his date painting and also all the journeys he was walking, that it was called the series I went, you know, like he was going from one point to another mm -hmm. and he just wrote a line in the map. And all mm -hmm. those walks, he started doing them in Mexico. So it's, it's very... Oh, wow. Uh, and I don't know where he got those very radical and conceptual ideas that they were not part of the atmosphere in Mexico at that time. You know? So right. very strange connection. Uh, and, and, and actually, he has, uh, I mean, I, I studied in the same academy where he studied, where he went for one year or whatever, that it's in the in downtown Mexico. So, and it's a very Baroque building, beautiful in the center of the town. Mm -hmm. a, 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 a typical academy, you know, where you draw naked bodies for six hours. Right. And then just come, you know, like a, a real art academy, nothing avant-garde at all, but the setting is very impressive. There must have been something in the water. That yeah, they... exactly, <laughs> or in the air, you know, like... The air or the water, it's, it's, yeah. it's a... or the altitude, I don't know. Right. This is, um, this is a work by Robert Berry. Yeah. Um, and and uh, when, when did you meet Berry, and, and how did that, uh, you know, relationship affect you in terms of knowing about his work, which is you know, which is often like this, it's very pared down. It's very, it's, it's yeah. taking the language of minimalism to, to, to language. Yeah, well, I, I met Robert Barry when I was uh, showing with Yvonne Lambert in Paris. So he was part of the gallery also. And once we, we were having shows at the same time in the gallery, and obviously I, I already knew about his work. And, I met him and, and, and for me, from all that generation, he was very radical because he really, I mean, I think these type of works that we're seeing now on the screen are the more conservative works that he has done because he, he has amazing works that he, he tells you a secret and that's the, that's the word. That's right. the word right. or sending a, a message telepathically. You no, know? so he was really, Dematerializing the object of art 
I think he was one of the most successful to do it, no? Or just to, in an empty room, say that there were uh, radio waves and that's it, no? Or, right. It was or, barely or, even or language. Gas. No, gas that it's, you cannot see it, you cannot uh, smell it, you know, like it's totally, you know. so I, I think he was, for me, the most radical in that idea of, Disappearing the object of life. So, right. So I decided uh, to do a project with him. You know, that it's a series of projects I've done with very few artists. He was the first one. Where we signed a contract on authorship of an artwork. So he comes up with one work of his own uh, uh, authorship. And I come with another work of mine. But we signed a contract where every five years the authorship switches. Ah, right. So for me, that was a comment of breaking the history of a work. Mm -hmm. Depending on when you approach the work, the author is Robert Barbie or me, depending mm -hmm. on the time you are showing it. So every five years switches. No? So right. five years is like having two personalities. Every five years, your name changes. Right. And also the value of the work, the, the, the history of the work. Right. So, and, and the other thing, and he was top great. And strangely enough, I approached also Lawrence Wiener to do this project. Mm -hmm. And he totally refused. He said it was he not did. part of the, oh. he couldn't <laughs> He couldn't not let his work go. No, like it's right. like, it's my work and I'm the author of that. So it was very, for me, it was very revealing also that yeah. the end he was not as radical as. Right, right. So, and, and it's interesting too that that, that that dance that you did with Barry, it's all constructed of, I mean, the entire thing is constructed of language, the contract. Exactly. The, the agreement that it's all. Yeah, so, actually, you know, the, language the most, becomes the infrastructure of it. Yeah, the most beautiful part of the work is the contract, no? Because it was written right. specifically. Because it has never been done in art history that an artwork has two authors, but depending on the year, it's one right. or the other. So, right. So yeah, it was it was a, a very interesting project in that sense of authorship and author and right um these next couple are are from uh john giorno who who um, passed away last year um and it, it seems to me that you know because he early on as a poet he was really using the 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 idea of the ready-made of of just you know of finding language often lifted from the newspapers or um or you know, as as in your work from headlines and and presenting that as poetry and trying to use the language of the of the or the mechanisms of the of visual art at that time to be a poet. Um, and so it, it's always seemed to me like there's a there's resonances between between especially between his work and your work because of the way he he picked up language and also how he reduces the the, 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 the sentences. It's very interesting how he articulates the aphorism, I right. find him amazing. Right. Um, so we're, we're um, getting here to uh, some of the work uh, in, the, sh in the, the show now in San Moritz. Um, and I thought that we would you know, look at a, at a few of these now and I'm hoping that you could talk about uh, the impetus for these. Um, they are using language um, and, and maybe I should, you know, some of this where you play with legibility, um, but, but you, you, uh, emailed me, you know, this, um, the, 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 the poem in essence, that's, that's yeah. on this work. And I, and I thought maybe I could just read it. Ah, cool. Uh, I, I, I would like to. Because it, you know, it, and, and looking at this where you're, some of it's legible, uh, others, in another way that looks almost as if it's been shot by William Burroughs, um, yeah, exactly. how it begins to disintegrate. 
but but some of this is obviously language that you lift from our daily experience of dealing with the way language is, is mediated by technology. Um, so I'll, I'll just read this as a poem. Get my silence, get away, unsubscribe, forget this device, subscribe and comment, unfollow, danger enter, death sentence, death cloud drop, bullshit, like unlike, post now, control copy barcode soul, distant drone, unleashed speed, unleashed speech, views, online disconnected, unforced error, no amplified music, quit living inside, unsubscribe successfully, breathe deeply, playback free speech free. Yeah, it sounded great, eh? <laughs> I, 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 mean, I, I, that's one thing I, 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 I really like about uh, John Giorno, that he really reads his poems. He's the best reader of his own poems. No? Mm -hmm. And for me, the voice, my voice is, 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 is an instrument that I don't like at all. So that's why mm. sometimes I prefer to have these words printed on the wall or, you know, I think they, they have the best sound possible when, when they are visually and not have my, my own uh, voice. Mm -hmm. the, um, your use of gold leaf and gold here uh, is, seems like um, a, a statement about language as well and that, you know, we are gold, gold is, a, is always a provocative um, choice. Uh, you know, because it says so many things about uh, race and class and privilege and, um, you know, it's, its history is obviously a bloodied one. But then I know you've also talked about how just as a material for uh, a raw material for an artist, using gold and gold leaf gives you all these possibilities uh, because it's so thin and it, instead of covering things, it actually reveals every single tiny crack of or, or flaw in whatever you're putting it on. And obviously it also reveals the language that you've put on it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I started using the gold leaf just after I did uh, the installation at the house of the Hyper Palimpses, where I was blocking the whole plywood with black painting. You know? mm -hmm. It was covering and covering. And now I want it to do the opposite. You know? How can I put layers that discover more layers for so reversing the, the system? No? And, and, and yes, I mean, I like that the gold leaf, even if it applied in metal, but the way I apply it on the surface, it's very gesture. It's very, it's like using brush stroke. And, it's so sensible to light and to surface that it reveals everything, no? all the imperfections, all the, everything that it's surrounded. Mm -hmm. I was very fascinated by that uh, idea, no? a material that it was not about covering, but it was about revealing. Right. And, but it also reads, um, it, it inevitably reads as a provocation. To a degree, I mean, it seems but the gold is so is so charged in a way. Um, well, I think every revelation is a provocation. Right. <laughs> every time you reveal something, most of the time it's provocative. You know? It's right something that you open your eyes to. You know? like it's right. A, 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 a revelation, you know, like right. I think revelations that are not provocative, they don't are they're not revelations. Right. And, and I think provocation, there's a very thin line in how you provoke. No? And I think you have to be subtle, but also powerful enough to, to confront the view. Right. This is, um, I, I just sort of looking at some works that are made from gold. This is a, a, a piece by Chris Burden that, that's really actually rarely photographed. It's hard to find where he... For, for a show, he will borrow, um, you know, with a whole lot of insurance and legal language, he'll borrow gold bar 
and make this fortress out of it. And it requires, I remember when I saw this piece at the new museum, when Chris Burden had a retrospective there, it requires guards, obviously. Uh, it, it, you know, it really does require a setup to protect this gold. And when you, when you go into this little room and you see the gold and you see the lights trained on it, you realize why, because gold is a freakish, um, it, you know, you realize why it's it empires have risen and fallen over it and why so many people have died because of it and gone crazy over it because it is a it's a stunning thing to see uh when you see this much of it in one place yeah i mean yeah. i think yeah that's also and, and this is obviously this is maurizio catalan's um america uh and and this is actually when it was installed uh, at blenheim palace um and, and I remember seeing this for the first time, at, you know, at the Guggen, when it was installed at the Guggenheim and, and actually going in there, shutting the door to use it. And it's, it's sort of otherworldly when you look at it. I think the difference that I'm doing between these two works that you have shown and my work is that these works provoke on the fact. It's right. It, it, it's, it's like, there's a fact there that it's it's like the diamond skulls of of, of Damien Hirst, no? Right, right. Actual material. It's a fact of, of and there's less poetry. There, no, I, I think right. in, in, in in my work I I, I want to touch that provocation, but also take it to a poetical space. No, it's about right. speculation. No, how the mind is so powerful to absorb and speculate about something that it's, it can be a fact or not but it's right. but it's there you know it's it's like talking about i mean here it, they're talking about the crime you no know? you can see the, the the evidence of the crime right here my work is more open to the interpretation or, or or the emotional feeling about that certain uh, values and it's a more existential problem towards speculation. Right. Well, it also, it seems like um, in, you know, it, gold and especially the, the, the fragility of gold leaf, you know, has, has had religious connotations forever. So it, it, it is more in the realm of um, kind of, you know, on the poetry and religion spectrum. Whereas, as, as you say, I mean, even, even with, with Chris's work, to a degree, this is about the, the poetry of gold, but it's really about the, the, the stone cold fact of what, what, that, what that stack of gold must be worth. Yeah, and also- And, and that's not what you're, what you're doing with these works. Yeah, and I can see that specific work as, as a critical, critical institutional critique. No? Right. Okay. How institution has to handle a yeah. fact that has this problematic, right. putting the institution into another uh, condition, uh, you know, like it's uh, pro problematizing an institution. That it's, right. I think, one of the strongest things that Chris Burden did all the time, no? Put the yeah. institution on crisis, no? Right, right. Um, I wanted to quickly go back, um, just because, I mean, because we're talking about your use of gold uh, to, to this to this work um, and you know if you could just explain a little bit about what how this came to be uh, you know that you you've taken a facade of a building and made it uh, use gold and then also use language yeah I was invited by uh, 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 um, an institution called top that it's in Folkestone and it's a non-profit institution run by the artists and curators and, and it was a time where the, the we were going to do a project for september but as soon as the the lockdown started i thought that it was the perfect time to do this type of work because the institution was it was an exterior work and we were blocking the whole facade with wood and then with a gold leaf, and then I, I spray paint the word okay. No? Mm -hmm. So uh, I 
behind it that during the lockdown, it was the, the perfect moment to talking about institutional critique to do a work like this because there will not be any institution in London who will, will be able to do this work at that mm -hmm. precise time. So it was really a, a challenge and it was very successful because we managed to to realize this installation on, on, on a period where nobody, non-institution was open. So it was like, instead of just concentrating on digital uh, media, I wanted to do something really physical and mm -hmm. also that it had a uh, big resonance. And, and your use of the word, the simple word, which is almost like a semaphore word, okay, how did that come about? Well, I thought that I wanted to have a word that it was uh, cryptic, laconic, and caustic in a way. You know? mm -hmm. So how can I reduce all those type of messages in, in, in few words? And, 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 and having this word okay spread on the facade like a scream, you know? and communicating to a general public and having the word okay. I mean, it was really questioning the, 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 the specific time we were living, no? that we're okay, we're gonna battle this crisis, we're okay, nothing is okay. You know, like it started like uh, bringing all this uh, questioning in the public that I find that it was very rewarding. No, it was a moment to to give this message that it could be read as a very positive or as a very uh, questioning the moment. Right, right. And also, it does seem to me like seeing it on a gold, on a on a golden painted facade, adds another layer of complication to it. Where it's yeah, are we okay? Who's okay? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, there's a yeah <laughs> yeah exactly no it brings up it was the for me the, the 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 one of my most provocative works because it was very direct and very open ended right i j just briefly before I, I i i look at questions that have been sent um i wanted to show let's see if i can um let me just quickly scroll through this. I wanted to, to, to show other examples of your use of, um, of material, of metal, uh, you know, I mean, gold being a metal, but this, this, this no exit work, which is, you know, clearly exit doors that have been rendered in this incredibly, you know, uh, this um, stainless steel that makes you want to touch it, but repels touch, because if you do, you immediately leave your mark on it, your fingerprint. Um, it's, it's, it's pristine. Um, and it, you know, it's obviously, uh, it, it's, it's not a door. Um, and, and then, and then the other uh, work that you've done, you know, which is essentially in a, a, a sealed escape hatch to a degree, um, yeah. or, you know, a, a way into the earth, that's likewise made in this stainless steel that that uh, you know in some ways is almost repellent I mean it's beautiful but it's repellent um, so I, I just I wanted to show these examples of the way that you've you've thought about um, you know materials specifically metals like this as a language yeah. for instance I mean I I when I'm producing work no, I use language but sometimes I want to challenge myself and how can I do something that doesn't have written words? Oh, so I decided to, to do this exit door, you know, that uh, it was a challenging also the idea of a ready-made. You know? How can you work with the idea of ready-made and, and also having this uh, idea of an exit door that it's a door that once you cross over, you cannot come back. No, in New York, always the exit doors in the buildings are for getting out. It's not for getting in and out. No? So the idea of having it also has a relationship to the door that Duchamp did in his apartment. No, that mm -hmm. 
it, it was a door that it was, it, depending on where you put it, was closing one room and opening another one. So you right. cannot have the two rooms open or the two rooms closed. No, there's always one option open. And, and, and this idea of having it pristine and located in a place where an exit door go, for me, this work for the viewer automatically questioned like the doubt about is this that is is this a real door can i touch it can i not touch it you know it, right. it, it something that looks so beautiful sometimes makes you very uncomfortable to deal with it no? right like uh, you, you don't know if and then if there's a space in the other side if i can go through it and yeah i think it, it, it's 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 a very aggressive work in the way that it invites you to come close and then rejects you immediately. Right. It's like inviting you just to the limit. You know? Right. And and then yeah. Right. Um, there's a. Uh, I, I thought we were coming up on the, the end of the hour here, and I thought we would. There's one question. And this sort of goes back to the gold works, which is, um, you know maybe you could address how they do in, in your mind and you talked a bit about this before but in your mind how they do or really don't address the our current political situation and you know obviously people are going to think about parallels between the gold and trump for example um and you know or or going back to the to the gilded age um and you know i i did put in this um this this picture, which which may be apocryphal, but it you know it's supposed to have been a a picture from uh, Donald Trump's personal plane with you know with gold plated um, bathroom fixtures. Um, I think and, I and, think uh, it really yeah. Turned and I know you, I know you were talking before about seeing the use of gold more as a sort of material and poetic gesture, um, but you know what do you say? to people who are obviously going to will read it inevitably because gold gets read that way as a commentary on on you know uh concentration of wealth uh privileged power politics etc well actually i think that uh, 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 how i see it and how i use it is also to celebrate in a way trump is part of that is part of the celebration of speculation. You know, like, I mean, I think uh, America and, and the world is obviously, uh, we're hooked to speculation, no? We're constantly uh, trying to figure out what's the next immediate thing happening, no? And I think gold is, is the material that symbolizes that, no? It's, it's, it's a speculative material. And it's also a poetic of speculation in our society, no? And, and Trump mm -hmm. has this ability to, to, to move us with all this speculation, no? And, and try to disorientate the speculation and, and bring new speculations all the time. So for me, it's a celebration of, 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 of speculation as a mm -hmm. theory. Right. Um, okay. Well, I think we we have come to the end here. Unless there's something you would like to add that I haven't asked, it's kind of nice to see the, um, the, the the these two pieces behind you here at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, They're my my there you my go. self portraits, my self scan portraits. Um, anyway, okay. Well, thanks, thanks for doing this, Stefan. I really appreciate it. No, thanks for, uh, for having this. It was really good, and I really liked the the way you uh, selected all the images. No, and uh, and and how things connect between image and and concepts. It is really interesting. Right. Okay. Well, hope to see you soon in the real world. <laughs>